Hi everyone and <clears throat> welcome to another lockdown lecture. Now this time we're going to look at something a little bit less historical and a bit more in the present um, but hopefully a bit more useful if anyone actually fancies getting a job in, uh, in archaeology. So we're going to look at something called commercial archaeology. Now as a quick introduction what we call commercial archaeology traditionally means non-academic archaeology. It usually um, involves a lot of hard hats, a lot of training and a lot of building sites um, with property developers desperate to get on with their development um, and desperate to, to clear the archaeology out of the way first. Uh, but as we'll see as we go through, commercial archaeology actually makes up the vast majority of archaeological work undertaken in the U UK and in Europe. Uh, and to call it non-academic um, is certainly doing a lot of people uh, quite a big disservice. There's so much work going on and, and most of it is such high quality that, um, that yeah, to call commercial archaeology non-academic and to think that all we're doing is, is digging holes is, is a bit difficult. But let's carry on and we'll see as we go along. So obviously, when any archaeologist studies archaeology at university, we always want it to turn out like this. Um, but pretty much for everyone, it turns out like this. It's a noisy building site with loads of stuff going on and usually everything's happening at quite a fast pace. To give you an idea of how um, archaeological employment breaks down in the UK at least, um, here's a chart showing some stats taken from the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists uh, recent market survey. Um, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists or CIFA that's our professional body, basically. Um, so as you can see from these stats, over half of the archaeologists employed uh, are involved in field archaeology services. Now, that sounds like it just means diggers. Um, but as I'll go on to talk about a bit, you know, field archaeology services isn't just about digging holes. There's a whole loads more to it than that. Um, <clears throat> but that essentially means kind of, you know, that aspect of commercial archaeology. 25% are involved in historic environment advice. So essentially that's people who work as part of the um, local or national authorities giving advice on planning applications and other developments um, and giving, uh, giving advice to developers and also um, people who own historic properties or archaeological sites. And then we've got 17% who work in education. So that's basically where your academic archaeologists sit um <clears throat> universities um and that kind of thing uh, and then there's there's really only two percent of archaeologists who responded to this survey at least who are involved within mu museums or or visitor services so so you can see the vast majority here what is this this is nearly 80 percent of people um are involved in commercial archaeology field archaeology services or advice to help with development or developer-led archaeology so let's talk a little bit about the planning process then um, <clears throat> and where archaeology fits into it. So archaeology itself has been effectively privatised since um, the late 1990s. Previous to that, if someone was putting up a new building, the local authority would send in archaeologists and it acted as a kind of rescue service. Um, but instead now we follow what's known as the polluter pays principle. So this happens in a lot of areas of development. Um, so with the polluter pays principle, essentially, if you want to build something and you're going to impact, in this case, the historic environment, um, then basically you have to pay in order to mitigate that, that impact. So there's going to be a loss to the historic environment and you need to mitigate that in some way or make sure that, that any, um, any damage you're doing doesn't happen. You know, you can change your development, but we'll go into that. Um, so let's say that someone wants to build a new building or, or even refurbish an old one. They first have to submit a planning application. So that then goes into the local council and then that gets considered by various people. And then as part of their permission, they may have some um, conditions on their application, for instance, to do something pre-development, um, like clear the ground or make sure there aren't any ecological concerns you know like repressive newts or anything like that um, and then also obviously archaeology can fit in there as well uh, and then once they've satisfied those pre-development conditions um, they can be begin their groundworks and they may also have to work under some 
planning conditions there as well, depending on what they're doing. Um, and then finally, they can they can complete their complete their uh, build. Now, archaeology, or at least commercial archaeology, as we're talking about, fits in at all stages during this planning process. Usually, and this does very much depend a bit on the developer, um, before a planning application is even put in, um, the developer will ask for a planning, uh, sorry, for a desk-based assessment or a DBA, um, <clears throat> an archaeological desk-based assessment. So this is, as the name suggests, a, a desk-based, um, a non-intrusive study of the proposed development area. So in order to do this, a commercial archaeologist would go off and we'd consult the what's known as the Historic Environment Record or the HER, which is a big database held by the um, county or the local authority, um, which lists all of the archaeological and historical things that have ever been found in the area that, that people know about, and also details of previous archaeological work. So we go and get that, the data from there and map that and have a look at what's going on around the development area. And then we'll also go and collect um, historic maps, any interesting archives, books, publications around the area. And putting all these together, we would create a kind of, the desk-based assessment would provide then a detailed overview of the development area um, and should build up a picture of the potential for archaeological remains there. Now, as I said earlier, it, it does depend on the developer as to whether they choose to do this before or after they put in their planning application. But generally, it's much better if they put it in before because then they have a, uh, an early idea of potential archaeological concerns and, and also they can then budget for them accordingly. So the next phase is where the um, developer submits their planning application and that then gets assessed by the planning authorities. And this is where the historic environment advice comes in. So if you remember that the 25% of archaeologists from the graph before, this is where they are. OK, the planning archaeologists, they then look at the planning application that's gone in and also read the desk based assessment if it's been submitted. And then they can decide on um, any relevant planning conditions, or at least they advise the planners as to whether or not they should apply a condition to that um, planning application. So if the desk based assessment shows any potential for archaeological remains or there's some other concerns with, you know, historic buildings, listed building um, curtilage or anything like that, then the planners, under advice from the historic environment um, colleagues, they will usually suggest a program of evaluation. Um, and this is where it moves away from the desk and goes out into the field. So and this normally takes the form of either some geophysics or, or trial trenching or test pitting or, or a combination of all those things as well. <clears throat> so once the evaluation is completed, depending on the results, one of two things can happen. Either there were negative or limited results, i.e. nothing was found, and so the development's allowed to proceed in terms of archaeology at least once the evaluation reports properly written and any finds that may have come up are properly um, archived and recorded. Um, or the evaluation revealed further archaeological deposits that the proposed construction work will, will have an impact on. And the next stage here can take a lot of forms, um, but essentially we always try to conform to what's known as the rule of preservation in situ. So preservation in situ means essentially leaving archaeology in the ground. It's safe there. It's been there for hundreds of years in most cases. Um, <clears throat> so we just leave it there. Everything will be fine. And if someone wants to come along in the future and dig it up, that's fine. But for now, let's just leave it there. So preservation in situ means just not doing anything. Don't touch it. Obviously, there's a development going on, so that's not always possible to do that. But there are ways that the developer at this stage can change their plans. Um, to make sure that any areas of archaeological importance are preserved beneath, for instance, car parks or, or green spaces. Um, or perhaps they can redesign their foundation plans a little bit, which might lessen the impact on buried remains. Go for a piling mat instead of, instead of um, strip foundations, that type of thing. There's a few things that the developer can do at this stage to, um, 
to avoid any impact and effectively preserve those remains in situ. <clears throat> but that is not always possible. Um, and so where we can't preserve in situ, we move into the into what's known as the, the official mitigation stage. And usually we start to preserve by record. So rather than preservation in situ, we're now preserving by record. So preservation by record means essentially digging things up, recording them very, very carefully by drawing, photographing, writing record forms, analysing them, and then boxing any finds and records for future study. So it's basically what you imagine archaeologists do. You know, it's, it's excavating everything and making sure that everything we excavate is recorded uh, as fully as possible. It can also take place here. So this doesn't necessarily mean just opening up the area and digging everything up. Um, it can also take place as a watching brief. So that's essentially when an archaeologist is taken onto the site and they um, basically stand in front of the machine and watch the early stages of construction and quickly record any remains that come up as they come up. Um, so watching briefs are usually undertaken on sites with, with a relatively low potential for archaeology or where the potential is unclear. So it's just a sort of check there, just to make sure that as things are going on, you know, unknown things don't pop up and, and get lost. So <clears throat> by this time, once we've been kind of properly integrated into the construction schedule so that's the other thing and a lot of people always say oh archaeologists they come in they get in the way you know i had one client refer to us as a um as oh goodness me 150 quid a day that's a lot of money for a for a um what is bearded a beardy weirdy sandal wearing archaeologist like right okay I mean, this was 20 years ago it's, things have changed quite a lot now but but essentially now archaeologists are deep within the construction schedule and if everything goes perfectly to plan we can get in, do our job, get out again with minimum fuss or disturbance, and then the building itself can just be completed. Um, and that is really how it has to work, and it's how it works on most sites now. Developers are very, you know, clued up on this, and they will call us in at an early stage to make sure that everything gets integrated into the overall plan. Um, so the time has really gone of where archaeology really holds up a development, or if it does, it's something completely unexpected or the developer is not is not um, putting it in the schedule correctly. However, <clears throat> once we've come off the site and their building's going ahead and they're all happy because there's no archaeology to do, the, the job isn't quite finished. Um, and as part of the developer's kind of ongoing commitment to the archaeology, they also have to arrange for the post-excavation assessment. So that's where everything gets properly analysed, we draw it all into a narrative and a, and a story for the site, um, and eventually we archive everything in a museum and then the results are published in journals or newspapers or books or wherever, whatever they are, depending on the results. So this post-excavation stage is really, really important. That's straight off, you know, that's off the site. That's where we have the specialists look at everything. And um, um, yeah, so that's a slightly different stage. Uh, and that can go on for quite a long time, depending on the, depending on the size of the site and what's been found there. Um, but again, the developer has made a commitment to funding that as well. So that's a very whistle-stop tour of how commercial archaeology in the UK at least works. But um, hopefully it gives you, you know, a bit of a clearer picture of how it all fits into the planning process, basically. Um, <clears throat> but hope And hopefully you can see that it's a completely integral part of the planning process and the development, um, you know, and, and development as well. Uh, and that commercial archaeology is, is the biggest employer of archaeologists in the UK by far. I mean, you can see um, you can see on this graph here, there was a bit of a dip in 13, but then it's going all the way up 2018. You know, we're back up to nearly 7,000 archaeologists. And this, is, of course, is three years out of date with, with the big sites like HS2 and everything coming on, on stream now. Um, you know, the need for archaeologists is really, really huge. Uh, and growing. So it's much bigger. There's more archaeologists now um, than on this graph. Um, <clears throat> and also the vast bulk of archaeological projects in the UK are undertaken by commercial archaeologists rather than universities. Uh, and as you can see in that quote there, which is also from the CIFA uh, profiling the profession study, 
The archaeological profession provides more than 6,000 jobs contributes and contributes over um, 100 million pounds to the UK economy every year and employs a lot of people in many fields. So if you want to get involved in pro professional archaeology, um, a good place to start is the CIFA website. There's loads of information on there um, about getting involved. Normally, commercial archaeologists will need to have studied archaeology at university level as an undergraduate. Um, however, there are ways to get in through different types of experience, um, and there's increasingly a, a large number of apprenticeships and MVQs and other short courses that are being introduced to help people kind of break into the field. As I was saying, with all of these new big infrastructure projects coming online, actually there's a shortage of, of archaeologists and um, a decent proportion of archaeologists working in the UK at the moment are EU citizens, so post-Brexit we're not exactly sure what's going to happen with that. Um, <clears throat> so again, there is a need for commercial archaeologists and new commercial archaeologists coming into the field. Uh, I'll be honest, it's not um, particularly well paid and it's really, really hard work in the field because you basically have to go out all seasons um, at all times of day. Um, and often it involves quite a lot of away work on building sites as well. Um, but it is a fantastic way to actually do archaeology, um, to discover kind of new sites and, and also... Um, yeah, to get paid for it as well. So if um, anyone wants any kind of further information or advice, please feel free to get in touch with me anytime. Um, I work for a company called LP Archaeology. We're one of the sponsors of Waterloo Uncovered. So um, we uh, are one of the partners of Waterloo Uncovered. We, we undertake all sorts of archaeological projects all over the UK and, and we're also very much at the moment supporting the apprenticeship schemes and trying to help people break into the field so if you want to talk about anything please do drop me a line by email and everything's there and um, I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.